Hello and welcome back to day three, and this is Hangout three of day three of uh, of the web. And joining me is Katya Beecham. She's the co-founder of Birchbox, which she'll talk about a little bit later. And joining us online, we've got Ali, who is in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, he's almost he's like my co-host. He's been with every he's been with us for every Hangout so far. Well, hi, Ali. <laughs> and we have uh, John who's much closer to, to here, he's in Paris. Hey John. <laughs> um, now, let's start by talking about Birchbox. It's been three years since you launched. Um, tell us about, was it, a, was it the, the business model that you have? I mean, was it a first for that? Or were you in using inspiration from somewhere else? So, I mean, obviously we didn't invent the concept of subscription. That's something that has existed for a long time. Magazines, fruit of the month, wine of the month, um, meat of the month now. Um, but what we, we did invent, the Birchbox model, um, and we are the only one really doing the model, though you might note that there are many people who have replicated. And the model is um, one where it's really about being a marketing company, a media company, and a commerce company in one. So what that means is, is that we have to generate new demand, and we do that via the subscription service, also via the content that we create, but we also then fulfill that demand, because when you try something through a Birchbox, you then can purchase it through us, um, directly through us as an e-commerce company, not an affiliate. So we hold inventory. Um, so yes, we, we invented that model um, in 2010. So the model is that, that you are a subscriber. I believe there's, there's different prices for men and women. There's different prices for <laughs> men and women. There are different prices in the U.S. Um, versus Europe as well. So you, um, is it $20, for example, for, for, men. for, for men? And uh, every month they will be sent a box right. full of uh, new uh, novel products. Sure, yeah. And there will be, be a surprise mix of products. It's always a surprise. So um, for men, it's $20 a month and you receive a couple of grooming items. So you could get something for your hair, something for your skin, a fragrance. Um, and then you could also receive, you will also receive a lifestyle item every month, which could be a new pair of socks or headphones or whiskey stones. Um, we have a theme like a magazine. And then we use your profile and your behavior to customize um, the products that you receive. For women, it's $10 a month and it's really focused on beauty and sampling and you receive samples of every single beauty category hair makeup skin um, fragrance nail and four or five a month for ten dollars you get to try the products that have been personalized for you and then when you're ready you can buy them um, and it's a very seamless process now, how many um, what, what kind of percentage of, uh, of the subscribers come back and buy the products that they've just tested? Yeah, so 50% of the subscribers are shoppers via birchbox.com. Actually, many more than that shop because beauty is still one of those categories that's predominantly shopped for in brick and mortar stores, so in physical retail spaces. And for every um, product sold on Birchbox, in many cases, three to five products are sold offline in a beauty store, um, which is you know part of what we expected to see, but it's a reality of the industry. Mm -hmm. Now, you and your co-founder, you, you, you came up with Birchbox uh, quite soon after leaving Harvard Business School. While we were in there, actually. So what, what generated the, uh, the idea? So we were business school students and we wanted to write a business plan. We started kind of looking around and thinking, you know, what could we create for a business plan? And we saw an opportunity for e-commerce, for a consumer product. Um, we saw that the internet was changing from being a place that was just about this perfunctory, um, perfunctory transaction. I want a book, I buy the book, to being a place that could be about inspiration. And we just noticed that there was a glaring hole for beauty, a $40 billion industry in the U.S. Um, that really really was lagging all other industries online. And when we thought about it, we realized that beauty is particularly challenging to buy online because the consumer expects to smell the product and touch the product and feel the product. So before Birchbox, the only thing happening in beauty online was replenishment, repurchasing the products you already have. And for an industry that launches 100,000 new products a year, we realized that with more consumers spending their time and money online, we could really define a new way to shop for beauty a first time purchase and beauty on the internet and that was the business school inspiration and in real life um, Haley my business partner her best friend was a beauty editor and that was the inspiration for what we want Birchbox to feel to the consumer it should feel like you have suddenly a beauty editor best friend who has access to the beauty closet knows what you look like and will give you the information you need to make the most out of products mm -hmm. 
that you must have been surprised no, to just come across this <laughs> hole in the market. It was really surprising. I mean, we see every other industry, fashion in particular, just really growing. Um, you know, the ease of returning in fashion, but because returns really aren't as easy or as acceptable in the beauty industry, you just it was a huge, obvious, glaring thing to us that it was it was interesting. It was growing at you know basically half the speed of the rest of the industries we looked at. Were you surprised because it was a because it was um, a first of its kind kind of model? Um, were you worried that asking people to pay a subscription for what <laughs> is free is basically a surprise? Yeah, uh, that it wouldn't catch on. You know. I think that when you're an entrepreneur and you don't worry about that because for us it seemed so obvious if we the way that we thought about it as consumers um, my business partners and I was that you know we are not beauty junkies we're not beauty hobbyists but it's very appealing to us to have just the best products all of a sudden at our fingertips and we thought you know people would value the idea of somebody doing the work for you so we vet the products we then tie them to your profile and without you having to do the work or the research to find a new mascara a new primer we do that we give you the relevant information and we just kind of make it so much faster for you to get to the point of purchase kind of cut to the chase so we believed inherently that people would value it now brands on the other side when we came and said we are going to charge people for samples um, they were really skeptical and they thought you know it's crazy consumers expect samples to be free it's a gift with purchase and they were incredibly skeptical but of course really excited because if somebody pays for something it inherently changes the way that they value that thing so it was it was a little bit of you know entrepreneur and, naivete and you don't pay for the for the samples no, the brands give them to us just like, you know, you think about a marketing tool, just like they would to another retailer. Well, congratulations on the idea. I mean, it's um, it now seems obvious, <laughs> but I guess three years ago when it doesn't exist, it doesn't. Thank you. Um, well, what you're here today to to talk about, you've already talked about, was the was women influence, influencers in digital. Mm -hmm. um, out of the 153 speakers, that this uh, Le Web. Mm -hmm. How many of them are women? Um, I heard less than 10. I counted. <laughs> there are 22 okay. if you, between the, the plenary oh, one and the brands and the startup competition. So 22 out of 153, it's about 14%. Is that representative of the, of the, the startup? world I wouldn't know exactly but it doesn't sound to be it doesn't sound way off I think um, in the past few years you see a big shift there are more and more female founders but at the same time you know definitely something where it's a new it's a newer trend mm -hmm. and I think it speaks to the fact that we're seeing more and more consumer product companies launch um, people are starting businesses um, and inventing products that suit them and that they really feel like if it suits them there might be a consumer for so obviously some of those ideas are going to come from women who have an idea for a product that might be more geared toward, toward a woman yeah we were, um, we were talking mm -hmm. with um, with Dina Kaplan yesterday mm -hmm. and she was saying that she never she never had a, a female role model mm -hmm. um, in terms of startup in any case uh, is that the case for you I have some female role models. I have some male role models. Um, I'm not. I don't think I seek a role model based on their gender, in particular. But um, it's definitely clear that women are are looking to help other women right now. Um, so very early on, the founders of Gill Group were really available and welcoming, uh, made time for us, and they were a couple years ahead of us in starting their company and kind of going through their hyper growth. Um, and the fact that making time for a company that has no brand awareness, nothing happening yet. Um, definitely was traction. I, I have male um, um, role models as well who are really important part of me kind of learning the new things that I need to learn. So what, why is it? Why, why are there fewer women in this, in this landscape than there are men? And how is that going to change? I mean, I don't, I couldn't tell you the reason why. I don't think for me it was, a, a, I wouldn't, I never started Birchbox thinking I'm a woman and this is like necessary to be a woman. Um, I started Birchbox because fell in love with an idea just like a man would, just like any entrepreneur would and thought that this idea has to come to market. There's an inefficiency in the way brands find their customer. There's an inefficiency in the way customers are trying to discover product. There's tons of money crossing paths and we could make the market more efficient. Um, and I think, you know, I, I can't say like what has prevented people from feeling that 
that way to date. But I will say that the fact that starting a business is less expensive than ever, the barriers are lower than ever, makes more people, women and men, able to really take something that's an idea and suddenly have a company. And in our case, n neither Haley or I were technical founders, right. able to use agencies at a reasonable <clears throat> price in order to create a site that has some sort of version of a minimum viable product. All the barriers to starting have you know, now decreased and mm -hmm. we can really just have ideas, test them within days, weeks. We tested Birchbox a, a month after we had the idea. Um, and you know, it's, it's just changing the speed at which we can really start to iterate. Yeah, the, the the fact is more democratic, obviously only going to help. But how um, in terms of funding, how how did Birchbox get funded? Arise? Yeah. Sure. So um, we raised money after we did a test while we were in business school in the spring of 2010, and then we were working on raising money the summer to launch to the public September 2010. So we fundraised um, a seed round in September 2010, but up until that point, it was really hard to fundraise. Um, we had run the business for two months and then stopped and then said we were going to launch in September. That was always the plan. And everyone we talked to said, awesome, mm -hmm. come talk to us in September. Mm -hmm. um, so that was frustrating. It was hard because we thought we had some great KPIs from our beta um, showing that there was a high willingness to pay, that the conversion from sample to full size was really relevant and strong, and that brands were so excited about this new way of customer acquisition. Um, but you know, we had to launch in order to get um, investors to be really interested, and then we raised 1.4 million in a seed round, and then a year later we raised another 10.5 million in a Series A. Okay, we're gonna we'll go to um, to Ali and John now. Okay, uh, let's let's go with Ali first. Hey, Ali. Hello. Actually, my question is, uh, what is the most challenging thing at Birchbox? How do you keep your customers more interested and keep coming more and more and keep shopping? You just answered your own question that the most challenging thing about Birchbox is that we're a monthly subscription service and every month is an opportunity to delight our customer or disappoint our customer and it's really critical to our business model that you stay with Birchbox as a subscriber for as long as possible. Um, so when we think about the biggest challenges there, some of them have been starting with personalization, but probably taking a step back um, to the earlier days, it was very challenging to get beauty brands who have been doing something in their own way for decades sampling in particular, customer acquisition at a larger level, um, to really change the way they thought about customer acquisition and to take a chance on a completely unknown company. So that affects us being able to get the right products in the door. Then allocating them to the right consumer is the technical challenge. And I think we've definitely um, gotten over that hurdle, but we're always iterating on that. Um, it's a lot of pressure. You know, it's, it feels like you're, you know, right when you finish one month, it's on to the next seven. <laughs> Um, but we love it, and the pressure is something that keeps everybody really motivated, and I think the team is kind of thriving on that pressure. How many subscribers do you have now? So we don't update our numbers all the time, but the last numbers we updated were from early summer, over 400,000 globally. Um, we're still growing very fast. We're staring that million down, um, and we plan on having millions globally, which, to be honest, when we started Birchbox, we didn't expect that to happen quite as quickly because, as you pointed out, we were asking consumers to do something that they had never done, and mo more importantly, asking brands to do something they had never done. So we hit our five year plan for Birchbox in month seven. We used to talk about having hundreds of thousands of subscribers and now we talk about millions. Um, so every six months or so the company looks really different. I mean that's that's uh, at least 400,000 boxes arriving Monthly, in yeah. doors every month. Yeah, it's an, and what's been very powerful for us um, as, a, as an e-commerce company is that box that goes out that suddenly um, Birchbox is on your mind. Suddenly, you know, we have a moment of mind share with you when your e email inbox is so cluttered. Imagine the power of getting a beautiful package for yourself in the mail where someone's thought of you. It's truly personalized. Um, that changes everything about everything else we do online. So when we send you an email, open rates are incredible, highly relevant content because the product in that email is something that you now have in your bathroom. Yeah. Um, so it really, it's really changed our ability to kind of break in and become a rather large beauty e-commerce company in just a couple of years. Yeah. Um, John, let's go to you. 
Yes. What's your business perspectives? Uh, is it more about uh, extending your business internationally, like uh, focusing on France, Germany, and uh, uh, the maximum of countries where you can uh, uh, export or bring birch bark con concept, or it's uh, you think it's working well for the the beauty industry, and you want to extend to other kind of products? Uh, using the same kind of business model like Birchbox being like a larger business model, not just focusing on the beauty and industry? Great question. Um, well, you can see that a little bit of, of the answer is in what we have done in the past three years. So we've done two things that basically show that we are doing both, um, taking both of those paths. One of them is that we launched Birchbox Man in 2012, May. And Birchbox Man, while it borrows some of the things from women's in sampling grooming, we also sample lifestyle items, which means that we are sampling something that isn't an inherent sample. It doesn't have a use-up factor. It actually is the end product, but we still think it's a great way to get to know a brand um, and to have a moment with that brand that could lead you to purchase other things, and we have shown it is very effective. So that has us thinking about you know, what else is out there. At the same time, the beauty industry is huge, um, and you can bet that we are really focused on that. Um, but because our consumer is more of a call it everyday consumer, the majority of our customers would not self-identify as being obsessed with beauty or grooming. We think about giving them a world that is more lifestyle. The Birchbox is a way of life. So you'll note that we merchandise the shop that way on our e-commerce store. We write about other things than beauty. And we are constantly launching products that are not beauty-centric, more for your home, um, more gifts for a hostess, um, food items, things like that. Um, but we still really believe that beauty is an important place and it has unique dynamics that work. Uh, as far as expansion, we did expand in the fall of 2012. We acquired a business that was based in France, the UK, and Spain. So we're now operating um, the beauty component of Birchbox in Europe. And that's a really important part of what we do today. The reason that we did that so quickly in our life, just two years in, was because our brands are global. Um, we started seeing consumers that really wanted Birchbox globally, and the response was many copycats of Birchbox. Um, but and that was really important to us. But what we really started hearing from brands is that they're launching products globally. The internet has changed the concept of beauty brands launching unique products necessarily in every market. And in many cases, many of their launches are global. And they want to work with one company to bring those products to market, to use those products, to acquire new customers, they want to be able to share learnings across countries. So we decided we need to do this quickly. Um, and we moved to Europe. And you can bet that we will continue to expand globally as well. But Sue, what do you think when um, the first time you saw that someone had mimicked your your model? Did you think kind of all oh, the cheeky monkeys, or did were you kind of did you get I'm a thrill from it? Cheeky monkeys. Um, <laughs> I think to be perfectly honest, the first time we saw it, we were you know frustrated. It's very it's unsettling. It's worrisome. You think that. You know, seven months in was when it happened to us. Seven months. We were, you know, growing far past any of our expectations initially. And we were really excited about the future of Birchbox. And suddenly, here comes copycats. And we think, what if the future isn't as big and isn't as bright as we're starting to think really big about our idea? Um, but to be honest, that quickly shifted. I mean, what happened to Birchbox is that we started being copied and then we were copied aggressively. I mean, every country you can imagine, every vertical you can imagine. And it allowed us to almost have other people do MVPs for us, um, understand what markets were really interesting, understand what verticals were interesting, watch um, what people were doing. And I think it also gave us a lot more perspective about what does it mean to really have vision for a company and really understand what you're setting out to do. And although you can always replicate an end product and, you know, in many ways, that's the beauty of innovation, um, you cannot replicate vision. It's really hard to get inside the minds of the company themselves. And execution is always the name of the game. If, if there's anything that my co-founder and I believe, it's that it's never the idea ever the idea. It's always execution and then timing. Yeah. Timing is also really important. So kind of went through the full, um, the full cycle of despair to anger to optimism. Yeah. We haven't got much time left. I'm going to ask Ali and John if, if they've got any more questions before, before um, my last question. Ali, John, give us a wave if you... Ali. Yeah, actually, what is the... What is the disappointing situation you've been in since you started Birchbox? And how did you cope with it? 
Tell us what you learned since you started by choice. Sure. Um, so many things. I think one of the, the big challenges is obviously like growing a team and taking the time to grow a team appropriately. I think in the earliest days, we had a really hard time carving out the time to grow the team because we just didn't expect to grow as quickly. And suddenly, you know, we were working almost 24 hours a day. That was really challenging. Um, and, and still today, I'd say like the most challenging and rewarding part of Birchbox is the team. We have over 200 people now in four countries and thinking about making Birchbox the best place to work for them and the most um, important part of their career, which is very important to us is something that is constantly challenging because it's people but it's those people who will innovate and take Birchbox to the next level it's their ideas and it's their hard work so it's worth it um, we have definitely made mistakes with consumers I can remember every single big mistake from printing like incorrect information on product cards to expired products that go in boxes and that is really frustrating when you're working so hard to you know bring an idea to fruition to suddenly have risk that you've lost the consumers trust or that they don't think that you have your eye on the ball. Um, and the thing that we've learned there is to just get in front of it. The second that we recognize there's a problem, we really make sure not to let the consumer tell us, but we tell the consumer that we made a mistake. Um, it costs us money. We, we usually pay back the consumer in the form of loyalty points, which is equivalent to cash to spend in our store. And we're just aggressive about owning up to things that we, when we don't deliver on the promise, we own that. And we tell the consumer that that's not acceptable because we really believe it's not. And then we step up and say, you know, we're not going to make the same mistake twice. But when you're moving at the speed that we're moving, if you're not making mistakes, then, you know, something is wrong <laughs> because, because it, you, you hold on to the steering wheel until you think the car is about to just break down around you and shaking so much. Uh, John. Yes, uh, actually two more questions. Uh, would you say that Birchbox is a lifestyle brand in itself? Yes, um, we definitely think of Birchbox as a lifestyle brand. We actually rebranded the identity of Birchbox in June of this year, 2013, because Birchbox initially was really started and founded in beauty. It was a very pink brand. Um, and in June, we recognized that the brand needed to be more of a way of life, more of something that you could see yourself a part of, whether you're somebody who identifies with beauty and loves that category, or you're somebody more like my co-founder and I who really enjoy looking great and having great product, but would by no means consider ourselves to be beauty hobbyists. And then, of course, for the men. Um, so the look and feel of Birchbox changed dramatically in June to um, really signal that we consider ourselves to be a way of life and something that is a part of your world. Um, so, yeah. And so uh, what I don't understand is... Um uh, you will bring some products from lifestyle brands, okay? Uh, but how how are you a lifestyle brand? I mean, for 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 the person who receives the box, uh, you think the uh, it Birch box gets some some specific values and uh, and and they they have a special uh, attachment to uh, to Birch box or they have a special attachment to the brands that are uh, featured in the different products uh, brought to the ban uh, to the box. Well, I, I can say really proudly and honestly that it's definitely an attachment to Birchbox. Um, okay. That was actually one of the reasons why we were so excited to launch the company. All of a sudden, from the beta test, which was a really ugly product, um, I can say so, with beautiful brands inside, um, you know, all of a sudden from that moment, customers talked about how we were changing their lives, how we were changing their access to things, and that was really monumental to us. I'd also say that we really invested in editorial as a way to build a brand and build a voice. Um, we have over 20 editors across the globe that are talking about the products inside the box, but they also talk about other things that interest them in the wellness category, food, entertaining, travel, all of those things that build an identity and a brand and a personality so that when you are reading our content, you don't feel like you're in a vacuum of lip gloss and mascara. You're really you know, engaging with a friend, engaging with content that is relevant and interesting to you. So being a lifestyle brand isn't just about saying you're a lifestyle brand or putting non-beauty products in. It's really about the other things that you bring into the world of the brand. And for us, we bring a lot of non-beauty into the world. Okay. Um, it's just, this will be the last question. The uh, I tried to download a Birchbox app. I know you've been asked this like probably by everybody who yeah. interviews you. But um, 
what's the there is an app yes okay there's an app for iphone okay okay is well, that I... yeah so so there's an iphone app um we launched it a couple months ago and um we also have mobile web so our our website works well on android's tablet so everything works well on web but our native app launched i guess in the fall of this year okay so check it out, download it if you have an iPhone. Okay, well listen, thank you very much for coming in and congratulations on what was an awesome idea that you seem to have executed really well. Thank you. Um, thank you as well to John and to Ali. We will be back at 2 o'clock French time with Brady Forrest from Highway 1. He's going to be talking about what's new and what will be new in hardware. Ali, John, please join us for that. Um, so we'll see you then. Thank you, Katya. Thank, Thank you. you, guys. Thank you.